we complain Jake isn't fighting a fighter. Well, now he's fighting a fighter, the UFC Hall of Fame. <laughs> what threats does Tyron Woodley uh, pose? He poses a lot of threats. He's uh, definitely Jake's most dangerous uh, opponent. Nobody's saying that the other three guys Jake fought were, you know, great boxers. Nobody's saying that. But if you look back at history and you look at guys who are just starting a professional career, just starting to fight, um, you know, they're not in there with killers. But I feel like on a, for a 3-0 and guy, for Jake to be facing a, a UFC champion like Tyron Woodley, um, a guy who's, you know, still relatively in his prime, very strong, very explosive. I heard you guys talking earlier. He's very powerful. Very, very explosive, uh, very quick twitch for Jake to fight a guy like that in his fourth pro fight in a Showtime main event on pay-per-view in an eight-round fight, on his fourth-round fight. There's a lot of things you got to take into consideration. This is a, it's not that small of a step, so it's it's definitely a step in the right direction. It's part of the UK, obviously, we're coming from the UK. We've got interest in Tommy Fury being here, I mean, on the undercard. Yeah. Now, a lot of folk back home are going to put two and two together. Why is Tommy on the undercard, on the Jake Paul here, over in Cleveland? Can we assume, as Team Paul, they spoke about it, a possible fight next, Jake Paul and Tommy Fury, if they get through Sunday night? We'll see how he looks. I don't know. Um, he's definitely a possibility. It's not locked in by any means. I mean, he's got to go out there and perform. Jake's got to go out there and perform. And to be honest with you, if you want me to be 100% honest, I'm not even thinking about him. I'm only worried about Tyron Woodley. Um, there's no Tommy Fury. There's no anything if we don't handle Tyron Woodley. So um, every, every ounce of our preparation has been all about Woodley. We haven't thought about Fury at all. Um, you know, best of luck to him on the card. You know, he seems like he works hard. He's a good kid. So best of luck to him. But we're only concerned about Woodley right now. And, uh, you know, we got to handle that job first. It's all good that Jake Paul's fighting all these fighters. I'm playing on Woodley and MMA fighter and stuff like this. But do you think it's the next fight you can see Jake in with a, a pure boxer, who, which is his number one spot, which is boxing rather than an MMA guy coming over, a basketball player or a YouTuber, that his next fight will be a professional boxer? It, it depends. Um, it could be. It might not be. I mean, Jake's business model is a little different than everybody else. Um, it has to. It would have to be a boxer with the type of you know credentials who can bring and warrant the type of show that Jake's putting on. It can't just be a one-sided promotion like it would be with most boxers. Um, and Jake, obviously, he's still he's only three and zero. He's not ready to fight the top top guys who can potentially bring you know the type of uh, you know the type of uh, acknowledgement that an event like this would need. So. Um, the, the, the right step's got to be taken. He's only 3-0. He's only been boxing a year and a half, almost two years. So um, with patience, he will fight a lot of good boxers. But right now, we're just picking out good names, big people, and, and still people that, you know, the general public feels like this guy's going to beat Jake. So it's not like we're we're taking guys who are 100% slam dunks. Like this, the majority of the people, especially in the MMA world, they all feel like Jake's getting knocked out. So this is a pretty dangerous fight for a kid who's 3-0. BJ, uh, obviously we've all seen the right hand. Yeah. Uh, it's devastating. Um, and we haven't had time to see a whole lot more because yeah. you know a lot, of, a lot of the fights ended like first round or, or something like that. Is, are, does Jake have a lot more weapons that we just haven't seen yet, or are you guys developing other stuff where it's just the right hand's working and kind of milk that cow while you can? It all works. It all works very well. And if we can just get into that second round or whatever, then you're going to see on Sunday night. Like this guy, I mean, th th that's why I'm excited. I think about this event is because what we see behind closed doors. Um, with top professionals coming in that we spar with hundreds of rounds. I'm not talking about 10, 20, 30. I'm talking hundreds of rounds over the last, you know, 18, 24 months. It all works. And uh, you, you're going to see that on Sunday. If Tyron gets in the second or third round, you'll see that. Um, you know, he's got a lot of other weapons. People have no idea. And uh, hopefully, you know, Tyron could. And, and that's why we took Tyron. I'm the one who said, I want to fight Tyron. His manager asked me. They're like, is Jake ready for Tyron? I said, yes, he's ready. And uh, hopefully this guy will take us into a second or third round because Jake needs to get some rounds. I don't want him just going in there blasting all these guys out. <clears throat> and with all due respect to, to Gibb and to Nate Robinson and you know Ben Askren, those guys weren't on Jake's level. And honestly, Tyron's not on his level either. So uh, you'll see that Sunday. Jake is still green in the boxing game. He is. Is, is he like a superior talent to most who, who take the amateur route? Like are there, are there still mistakes he's making and, and growing or? I mean, of course he's still making mistakes. He's 3-0, you know? He's, it, it takes years and years and thousands of hours to perfect your craft. You, you don't just wake up and you're, an, you're, you're a seasoned professional boxer. I mean, you got to take your lumps in the gym. You got to take your lumps uh, uh, in training. And Jake's done that. Like, Jake sparred with, you know, world champions. Jake sparred with, you know, top contenders. And, you know, he hasn't, he, he's taken his lumps, trust me. It's not like he just goes in there and he's baby. He's not. And that's the most misunderstood thing about Jake. People think, we go easy on Jake. People think he's soft. He's not soft. And I mean, whoever gets in there with him, it's, it's almost too late by the time you get in there to realize, man, this guy's actually pretty good. 
And, uh, you know, once you get into the second and third round with Jake, I mean, he's still going at the same pace and going faster and harder and harder. He's like a shark, I'm telling you. I was, t- I was talking to my dad yesterday, I compare him like a shark. Like once he gets in the water and he, f- he gets in there, he just wants to swim. And then once he tastes a little blood, he's like, he, he, he goes crazy. So he's, he's, he's really got that kind of like sick, you know, um, that sick personality where he wants more whenever he gets going. And uh, I like that. I'll follow up on that question. And you've been in the game long enough, the professional boxing game, you fought for a world title. And um, us in the UK will remember that, but how far can Jake go then? You, you've seen him in the gym, he's three and all, you said he is a novice, but how far can he go in this boxing game? Um, I didn't really say he's a novice. I just said that he's just beginning. You know what I mean? So he's not like, oh, his, his skills are novice. I, I didn't say that at all. I just said that he's starting. He's getting going now. And he's, he's, he's very far advanced from, from where he should be, honestly. I mean, for a guy who's only boxing two years, he has no business sparring and handling the guys he's sparring with. None at all. And it's just remarkable. It's because his fundamentals are good. His fundamentals from point A to point B, he's very efficient. He's very sharp. Um, we, we, we take out any little distraction or any little thing that would possibly... Um, you know, we, we keep it as simple as possible, you know, simple, stupid. It's really, it's really effective in the boxing world because if you're riding a bike and if you're, if you if, say, if you're a professional swimmer um, and you're swinging against an amateur, the amateur swimmer might be a stronger swimmer than you. He might be, have more endurance than you, but the professional swimmer has the better technique and over a mile swim, you know, if that amateur swimmer is going a little bit left and a little bit right and that professional is going straight and straight and straight, he's going to get there first. And that's the, that's the mentality I have with Jake. I want his technique perfect. I want his fundamentals perfect. Um, his form is very good. People that spar him, they can't believe it. And uh, that's that's what we thrive on. I mean, you can't, if you can follow the fundamentals and if you have good fundamentals, you can go a long ways in anything. You know, Kobe Bryant said it best. You know, I practice the most basic things every single day because that's what makes me great. And I, I, I believe that. So you, you've been in the game a long time, like you said. Do you see like championship potential in him? Like he's calling names like Canelo. Like- <sighs> Can you see Jake potentially hitting that level? Like, does he have a love for the game like that? And do you, I mean, do you see that type of potential in him? Or? I mean, look, like I think anybody when they first come into a new sport, they want to go after the best guys. You know, yeah. to say he's ready for Canelo right now, I'm not going to say that. I mean, come on, like <laughs> Canelo's the pound for pound number one. That level, I guess, at some point, like I mean, it's a lot yeah. of work to get there. Yeah. I mean, I'm, let's keep it real. I mean, he's everyone. You, you can't knock Jake for wanting to fight and do the against the best guys in the sport. He wants that. And honestly, if I had Canelo in the gym on Monday to spar with him on Monday, Jake would get up and he would go full at all at Canelo as hard as he possibly could. So, I mean, he's got that mentality where he will go in there with anybody. He does not care. And uh, I like that. But me and his manager got to be the ones, you know, make sure and make the right moves. But, uh, you know, to say he's going to fight Canelo in in six to 12 months, I'm not going to say that. We've got another uh, another schedule and another uh, another path. But uh, to say in three or four years, you know, Canelo's maybe 33, 34. Jake's maybe, you know, 27, 28. We'll see. Um, you know, Canelo to me is the, is, is the, the best pound-for-pound pound fighter right now. Um, there's not even really discussion to me based on resumes. I mean, the guy's resume is unbelievable, incredible. He fights every single challenge. And, uh, you know, he's, just a, he's an amazing fighter. So, uh, like I said, I, I don't like to forecast too much in the future, but, you know, anything's possible. Jake, who do you compare Jake Paul's work ethic to? Because people don't know he works very hard. Um, I'm thinking back, uh, like, you know, through my career, some of the tireless workers, um, I, I've been around a lot of hard workers. I've got a lot of guys who really, really get in the gym and really train hard. I don't think I've ever been around, um, in any camp ever with, um, any fighter, any champion that has the structure that he's got on a daily routine, as far as schedule, as far as chef, as far as meal plan, as far as every little thing he does throughout the entire day is on schedule. Um, everything it's planned out to a T and if you look at they did a survey a couple years ago of the 10 most you know successful people in the world and how they got to where they are and they all have a very detailed routine a very very structured schedule every single day because there's a lot of power in a routine there's a lot of a lot of power in um, you know following a uh, a hard schedule and I feel like that's something that, that that's given Jake a lot of success um, not to mention you know having a good team around him uh, myself, Jacob Chavez, he was my trainer for, you know, 10 years. He was Kenny Adams' assistant. Um, it's no secret how I got started through Kenny Adams with my dad on the, on the Army team. And Kenny kind of brought me along And when I first turned pro. And, you know, Jacob was the mitt guy for, for Kenny Adams. And we also have Jay Leon Love, um, a very, very good professional boxer, but also a very good boxing mind. And he gives Jake a lot of good encouragement in, in training, a lot of good little tips, like professional tips that you couldn't get unless you were in there. So he's, he's another guy who's also very good. So between us three, um, between Jake's team, between his schedule and between his work ethic, I mean, he's a, he, he, he's a lot to deal with. He really is. So 
Yeah. He doesn't take time off between fights. It's not like he's going to take six months, but Luna, you keep him in the gym. A week off, two weeks off? Ellie, we don't have time, you know? He didn't start boxing until he was 21 years old. And if we're going to be calling all these people out, we don't have time to really mess around. So we got to get after it. And uh, I, I don't really have time to hear, like, I need time off or whatever. We don't have time for that. we got a lot to learn. we got a lot to make up for. So Jake, Jake already said the schedule. He said everybody that's in camp, everyone that's on the team, September 13th, look forward to being right back in camp. Yeah, we have two weeks off, and that's it. So we're right back so, in. And whoever's next, whether it's Fury or whoever it is, then they better get ready because we're going right back to camp. What do you make of his list then? I mean, on Twitter, he's got about a 10-man list. I mean, there's some killers on there, Masvidal, Usman, the Diaz brothers, Canelo, Tommy, his own brother. I mean, he's made a, a big list on who he wants to fight next. So, <laughs> I mean, Javante Davis was there as well. Well done, Ellie. So, I mean, there's some killers on that list, man. What, as, as coach, what do you think when you see this list? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a trick, it's a trick question. Are you just going to get spun around the media or what? Like, I mean, look, I mean, again, I'm going to go back to the Canelo question. Like, how, how can you want, how can you fault a guy for wanting to fight the best guys in his division? I mean, I feel like not even his division, the best, the best guys across the board. He wants all the best guys across the board in the boxing ring. Um, why the boxing ring and not the MMA octagon or, the, or the, in, the, in the MMA world? Because the pay and the structure and everything is a lot better in the boxing and it's giving these guys in the MMA community an opportunity to come over here and make a lot more money. So that's why um, if Dana was going to pay massive amounts of money for Jake to go over in the octagon and pay m incredible amounts of money like Jake, maybe Jake would consider it. Jake but can wrestle, right? He, he can, but I mean, our, our thing now, he wrestled in high school, he's a good wrestler, his brother also very good, but you know, the money that is in the boxing right now and the, and the money that Jake is creating, um, Jake's brand is creating, the opportunity, like I think that goes like a lot unsaid. Like everybody on this card, even per Steven Espinosa, he said, look, like, guys, everybody on this card is making more than they've ever made. Why? Because Jake said, look, I want to make sure these fighters are paid fairly. Um, most valuable promotions. We're going to go out of our way and make sure these fighters are all taken care of. I want them paid. I want them well looked after. And I got to tell you, I've gotten hundreds of you know calls and texts and emails from other fighters that want on cards. And it's contagious. And it's only going to get bigger because Jake wants fighters to be taken care of. And you got to like that as a fellow fighter. You respect that. So um, to circle back to your question about the list, we'll see. I'm looking at one guy at a time. There's not too many guys on that list that scare me, to be honest. But um, a couple names, we, we still got a little work to do. But but some of the names on that list in the boxing ring, line them up. We could really do it. So. Let me ask both of you guys. What's the biggest punch that Jake landed that you guys encountered? Anything that stands On up? me? <laughs> he didn't land anything on me. I, I hold the mitts. What do you mean? No, I didn't <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you, like, you can answer that. I don't know. I don't know. He has so he has so many so many great tools. You know, he he has you know both hands, both sides. Uh, his angles we've we've created for him and this fight are going to be something for the crowd to see. Something different. So uh, he has power in both hands. I think his right hand. Everyone sees that that's one of his most you know strongest shots. But I think if he has a chance to work his left hand a little bit more as the fight continues, everyone will see that's just as good as well. Speaking of his list, his brother is on there. Um, have you guys been a part of, like, you know, and on those sparring sessions, like, who, who's getting the better who? They don't spar. They don't spar each other? No. no. They've never sparred. No. no, they don't spar. Not really. No. Playing well, around. Have you guys gotten that one? That, that's, a, I mean, <laughs> you know who I got, but it's, it's, it's really, really, <laughs> yeah, Jake, of course. But the thing about it is, like, with Logan, I just, I, I can't, I can't even, that would be the last name on the list, I would say. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's, it's family, you know, Greg and Pam. I'm just like, you know what I mean? The parents, I mean, I would get a lot of slack. They've had their ways. moments. They've had their moments. It's just like, you know, with Logan, Logan mm -hmm. comes in to camp and watches Jake train. He offers a lot of encouragement. He comes in. It's like, I don't know. Like, that's, these, these brothers are sick. Trust me, they'll fight each other. Yeah. But to me, as a coach, I would rather just, you know, be like, hey, you know, maybe that's one we, 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 we talk about, but maybe it never happens. Here's one for you then, BJ. Yeah. He's willing to fight his own brother. Yeah. If he calls you out as his coach and wants to fight you, <laughs> what would you do? I mean, listen, listen he's crazy. Enough. We're taking a sick, twisted turn down a wrong road, and we're, we're going into you know, left field. Awesome. We're going into left field here. I'm not going to answer that. Go on. <laughs> what else? Bringing it back in. Uh, yeah, yeah, good. Perry went on record to yeah. say that he sparred Jake and yeah. he got fucked up. Is that true? Yeah, it is. But we didn't talk about it, you know? Mike Perry said that, and Mike Perry will admit that on his own admission. And look, me and Mike texted for a long time after this after the sparring session. He's like, man, I can't believe it. Like, that guy is, you know. And I said, hey, if, if you wouldn't mind, can we keep this kind of low profile and not really talk about it? And he was like, yeah, I figured you guys would be telling everybody, and you haven't told anybody. And the reason why we've been able to um, have success getting getting people to, to fight us and come in, people don't really know how, how good Jake is right now. And I'm not saying he's the next Muhammad Ali. I'm not saying that. we got a lot of work to do and a lot to prove. But... He's pretty good. And people are going to be surprised on Sunday, like how one-sided the fight with Tyron is. 
Um, it's going to be one sided. Don't do not get that misunderstood. It's going to be one sided. And, uh, you know, hopefully Tyron goes three, four, five rounds. Uh, that'd be great if he did. If he goes five rounds and just know that Tyron will have worked his ass off in camp to get into those fourth or fifth rounds because no sparring partners were really able to do that. So um, it's going to be tough for him to get into that deep in the fight. So um, but, you know, um, to answer your question about Mike, I wish Mike the best. I know he kind of got confused and was saying some stuff about Jake after when, when Jake was going to fight Tyron. I don't know what exactly was going on with Mike in his life at that time, but I wish him the best and I wish him well. So. Uh, you kind of talked about how Jake has been advocating for fighter pay. And we all know the story about the UFC. Does it take a personality such as a Jake Paul to kind of change pay structure? Because it seems like the fighters can't do it within the structure. You need somebody from the outside. Yeah. I mean, what do you think about that? Honestly. I, mean, I think you need somebody from the outside that's bringing attention to the situation. Anybody in the UFC who says it, guess what? They won't be fighting. Bad. They won't be doing it. They'll be banned. So it takes someone like Jake to raise awareness because really, they got a, a pretty good monopoly. Get, Danny's got a pretty good thing going on, going on over there. He says who fights who, when they fight, everything, what they get paid, everything. So, you know, um, like, you know, Jake's brought to the attention the percentage of, of professional teams and what they give to the fighters and what they give to the athletes compared to the UFC. And I, I think the UFC is pretty undervaluing their fighters for what they bring to the table. I mean, those fighters are tough. They bring a lot to the table, and fans come to see the fighters. They don't come to see, you know, Dana and everybody else. Has Dana put, done a great job? putting it all together and doing it and promoting it how he did with those seasons of, what's it called, the contender. season he did, of Contender and all that. Yeah, he did a great job. But they're not there to see Dana. They're there to see the fighters. They are. And the fighters need to get paid better. Is that a part of strategy on Jake's uh, behalf, calling out Dana in order to kind of rile him up and have him <laughs> send more fighters to Jake? Um, I, I, I think it's pretty, pretty well known. Like, Dana's not really... He's not really willing to send any fighters to Jake. Um, he doesn't really want to take a chance and lose, you know, one of his guys that he's got under contract right now at the moment to, to, to lose to Jake in the boxing ring. And then all of a sudden their marketability goes down and kind of messes up his business plan. Um, I don't really think he's willing to send any. I think it's guys who have just been recently released that we have to kind of target. Um, you know, if the fight was big enough, maybe Daniel would be willing to play ball and do a little business. Um, and if not, then we just got to kind of play it by ear. Were there ever talks with Usman? I know there was conversations. No, and Usman's one of the, you know, I think Usman's a name that came up. I think he called out Jake, and Jake's got an answer for everybody, trust me. Like, you know, whether I like it or you like it, he's, he's going to answer everybody. And, uh, you know, um, Usman's a great champion. I feel like he's one of the best fighters in the UFC right now. I think he's got incredible hands. I think he's very underrated in his hands. He's very good. Um, and, and some of the guys that I respect in the in, in the MMA world, Hav Mendez and other guys, they, they really talk highly of Usman and his, his striking ability and how much better he's gotten the last two years. So, um, you know, I think that's a real, real challenge and a guy who would be very, very, he, he's a handful for anybody, um, you know, in the UFC, but he'd be, even be tough for Jake, you know, in the, in the, in the boxing world because his hands are so good. But um, I don't, I, with where he's at in his UFC career right now, I just don't feel like that's a, that's a realistic fight right now. Why is he taking up the issue of fighter pay so much? Is he just a good guy, or what's behind it? Why does there have to be something behind it? You know what I mean? Oh, I don't mean something behind it in a nefarious way. Yeah. I meant what's his motivation? You know him. Yeah. What's going on there? His motivation is he's just coming into a sport and just like, why are the fighters not making what they bring into the table? Like Jake, look what Jake creates. Jake creates millions of buys or hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of buys, and he gets a portion of the money. How come... How come other fighters aren't, you know, and, and, it, and it took him. Jake's a smart business guy. He's a smart businessman. He's a 24-year-old with a 45-year-old head on his shoulder. He really is. He's done a lot of business. He's done a lot of good business. He's been burned a few times. But those, those, those experiences that he had where people kind of got the better of him or took advantage of him, they, he still learned. He's a smart, smart guy. And uh, this guy gets involved in his business and gets involved in his money. And he sees the platform. And he sees, he sees the, the structure of how fighters get paid. And he's like, this isn't right, you know. So that, that's pretty much it. He's, he doesn't gain anything by paying his fighters more money on the card. I mean, what does he gain by that? It's money out of his pocket. You know what I mean? But he likes having people that associate with him come up with him, and that's very, very credible. Very, I mean, very. Uh, it's it's just it's just a good it's a good attribute of Jake. DJ, online we see a lot of people inboxing hate on him. It just is, uh, but when they see him in person, how do they act? Because you're with him a lot. That's fine. I mean, he's misunderstood. Like I said, I mean, some of his interviews. I mean, he's flashy. He says a lot of things that are. Uh, you know, um, you know, rile, you know, rile a lot of people up, and that's why he's got me and Jacob here to kind of, you know, <laughs> be the OGs and kind of pull him back. And sometimes, but he's very effective. I mean, he 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 does what he does. He gets people riled up, and uh, but he's he's got good people around him to make sure that he's working at the same time. So, I can guarantee everybody in this room that he's not talking with no substance. I guarantee you that. 
and, and, and whether you believe me or not right now, when the first bell rings on Sunday night, you're going to see what I'm talking about. I guarantee. And there's going to, you're going to be, holy shit. It sounds like the game plans, yeah. you know, to come out and finish them. Does Jake have like the cerebralness and, and cardio endurance to go all eight rounds to get a decision? hundred percent. Does Tyron. Tyron doesn't have the experience in the boxing room, honestly. So that's the misconception here. The misconception is that Jake's the inexperienced guy, but Jake over the last two and a half, three years has sparred hundreds and hundreds of rounds with guys that Tyron couldn't have possibly gotten in there with. So the, the UFC cage and the MMA cage is different than the boxing ring, and you're going to see that. Tyron's going to get tired before Jake, trust me. Jake won't get tired. Tyron will get tired. Tyron's not going to be used to a pace like this. Tyron's not going to be used to, uh, you know, dealing with the kind of pressure that Jake's going to have and the kind of power, um, you know. He's a great, Tyron's a great wrestler. We respect him a lot. We, I think he's an amazing athlete. It's just too bad we had to fight him this time. But I mean, I, th I feel like he's a really solid, um, you know, athlete and a very good, a very good striker for the MMA world. He's a very good striker. In our world, he's a very inexperienced, mediocre striker. But he's still very tough. He's very credible. He's going to try hard. He's got that championship mentality. So we, we, we're taking it serious. We respect Tyron a lot. But he's going to be the one in deep waters in this fight, not Jake. Who's the one guy you think that uh, Jake Paul gets under his skin the most? He rattles a lot of people, but who's the one person who stands out to you? I think it's a tie between about 10 people, probably. <laughs> <laughs> 13 minute tie. <laughs> I can't, top, I don't know. Two, you guys tell me, I don't know who gets, I don't know. It gets a lot of white, number one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but what's, what's not true about what he's saying about Dana, though? Are there any, are there any false things? I don't know what he's saying that's not true. I don't know. Like, you tell me. Like, I try to stay out of all the rumors and all yeah. the, oh, this guy thinks that. I, I don't really get involved myself with that, but I just I just want to make sure he's ready for Sunday night. So I, I can't really answer that question too well, I guess. He, he said if he ran into Dana in the club, he'd, he'd knock him out. Dana's been known in the boxing world. Oh, my God, you think bro. Dana, Dana can handle himself? No, right? Dana could not Dana handle himself, prime? yeah. No. no, no, not at all. But Dana would try, which would be funny and hilarious. But, yeah, it would, it would be, you know, yeah, be a short one. Maybe that's the next big fight. You know, fight Dana knows better. He would never last one round, not even one round. So we take that to the bank, put that on record. Dana would not last one round with Jake. Big gloves, little gloves. He wouldn't last one round with Jake. That'd be hilarious, though. You know, so or Oscar. He keeps calling out Oscar too. He wouldn't last fucking thirty seconds with Oscar. So yeah. Can you talk about his relationship with Amanda Serrano? Because we talked about MMA fighters getting paid. Women fighters have not been no. getting paid. And he put her as a co main event. This is a woman who's won world titles you know, nine times over in seven different weight classes. How admirable of a trait is that to put the spotlight on women's boxing, which has been pushed to the back burner for so long? I absolutely love it. And Nikisa, remember when we were, we were getting this card all lined up and everything, we were deciding who's going to be on the undercard and everything. And, you know, Nikisa, um, Jake's manager, made some excellent moves. He said, hey, Charles Conwell, you know, Montana Love, getting the local guys from Cleveland and, um, you know, getting, getting you know, the, lo the local people, you know, riled up. But circling back to your question with Amanda, I mean, Amanda is, you know, probably one of the most exciting female fighter ever born, honestly. Not only has she got all these wins, um, but she's got knockouts. She finishes opponents where, you know, if you look at Katie Taylor and you look at Clarissa Shields, you know, as good as they are, they don't get fighters out of there like Amanda. Amanda fights like like a seasoned pro. She goes to the body, she attacks. I mean, she's just a she's just a savage fighter. And she's Puerto Rican. And as everybody in this room knows, Jake relocated to Dorado. He's in Puerto Rico now. We started his Boxing Bullies uh, anti-bullying um, campaign, that platform. We, we've done an event. We want to do events all over the country where Jake is putting boxing gloves on kids all over the country, giving them opportunities to train, to work out, setting up gym facilities for them. I mean, hate all you want, but I don't see anybody else out there doing that kind of stuff. So we're just going to put our nose down and keep working, and people can say what they want to say. Um, but, like, what he does with, you know, for, for fighters like Amanda, this, and Amanda's came up to me, and she's, I've gotten to work with Amanda a couple times in camp. She's like, BJ, this is, this is changing my life. You have no idea what this means to me. I will always look at Jake and always look at you guys um, in a different light because you, you're really changing my life here. And I, I don't even, words can't even describe it. And that, that's, that's what life's really about. You know what I mean? How many people can you help come up? And that's really what Jake's about. And people might not see that right now, but they will see it. Jake's about bringing other people up around him, and he's very good at it. So Jake, Jake can change your life in a second. Trust me. Mm -hmm. PJ, what happened with uh, Jorge Masvidal and, and the kind of flip that happened between him and Jake with what do you know about that? I'm not sure. I don't know. And I'm not going to speak on Hori's uh, behalf. Um, we went to his gym one time. We trained with him a little bit. Not, not too much, just messing around. And he was very, very gracious and very nice. And something obviously happened along the way, and that, as, as it does in sports sometimes. And, you know, now Jake's fighting Tyron. And Tyron and Jorge have been, you know, teammates for a long time. And 
where he's kind of riding with this guy, which is understandable. So I don't really think it's too much bad blood, except for the fact that, you know, in the fight world, that happens sometimes. And I'm going to stay out of that. I don't know. Did it, from your experience with this journey, where you started with it, when no one believed in him, no one thought, now your pay-per-view on Showtime, how has it been from your perspective? Um, I told him when I, when I first went to Big Bear, they called me in December 19th to go in as a sparring partner before the Gibb fight. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it was kind of crazy. I, I didn't really know who he was. And once I went into camp with him and sparred with him, I always like sparring with somebody to, to feel like what they do well. And, you know, I was, I was, you know, three and a half, four years removed from a world title fight. I, I was, I wasn't in great shape, but at the same time, I still, for a couple of rounds, I was, I was a handful for anybody. And, uh, when I got in there and I felt what he was able to do and how he was able to attack, as green as he was and as inexperienced as he was, I liked the nuts and bolts of what he had. I really did. And I was like, you know what? I can do something with this kid. He's tough. He, he speaks his mind. He's a hard worker. He's a tremendous athlete. People don't know that about him, but he can take a shot and he can give a shot. Trust me. And this was, you know, this was two years ago. Um, I just feel like I, I saw a lot of potential then. I saw a lot of possibility. And once we started cleaning up some of the basic mistakes he was making, he really started transitioning into a fighter who looked like he'd been fighting a lot longer than he has. Um, he's got a tremendous team around him. I'm not even talking about myself. I'm talking about all around the board. Uh, Jacob Chavez, Jay Leon Love, um, his, his assistant, Marcos, his strength and conditioning coach, Chef. D-Cut. Yeah, By Chef Byron, uh, Jay Leon, like I said, uh, uh, Ocean Enter being the, the guy who does all his, his, his healing and his, his uh his massages and everything. I mean, there's so many components to, to this great team and he's got a good team around him. So I'm not surprised to be honest with you. Um, but to be in his second eight round fight on a Showtime pay-per-view on a platform as large as Showtime, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, when has that ever been done? In a fourth fight? Adam. In a fourth fight and an eight round fight. I mean, that alone is credible right there. Most guys are still fighting four rounders, much less six rounders. Now his second eight rounder already when he's three and up. That's, that's, he's working his ass off. So got to give him credit. So you didn't get hit by Jake. It's far. <laughs> yeah, about, <laughs> yeah, about about two years ago. Yeah, he took a couple himself, but uh, I definitely got hit a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> What'd you make of yesterday's events between uh, Mama Woodley and, and D Cut and all that? I think what was got, the conversation had afterward. I think you got blown out of proportion. Um, you know, the the thing about it is, and you got to respect, um, you got to respect Woodley's team, which I do, and you got to respect our team which it didn't seem like there was a lot of that going on, um, which whatever, you know, we're, we're, we're the OGs. We're not, we're not worried about it. They got to fight on Sunday, but you got to realize when it's three days before the fight and both teams, families and best friends are in the crowd and there's yelling stuff and, uh, you know, D cut here, something, the mom yells and the mom yells something. And it's just, it's easy to get things, you know, mixed up like that. And, and my, my feeling is whenever a mother is yelling for her son, just, just let her yell, whatever she's yelling, I, I, whatever it is, you know what I mean? Let her yell. Um, you know, mothers are sacred. It's something very important. But at the same time, you know, when, when, when that goes into the sister running over and cussing him out and getting in front of his face and all that, and then the other guy coming over and pulling his knife out, I mean, I mean, what the hell? Like, I mean, come on, who, who brings that to a press conference? So just, you know what I mean? It's just like it got out of control, got out of hand. Um, we're, we're fine. We already hit the clear button. Um, Jay handled it like very professional. He apologized, even though he didn't even say anything. You know, he just kind of was up there trying to promote the fight. But uh, it, it is what it is. Uh, he just uh, you know, he's ready to go Sunday. But uh, I think it got blown out of blown out of con, out of proportion. And, uh, you know, we obviously don't have any disrespect towards, you know, Mrs. Woodley at all. Mama Woodley. I love that she's in her son's corner. I think it's great. And, you know, really a lot of respect to their entire team. You know, Pedro Diaz, he's a Hall of Fame trainer. Um, you know, Gerald Tucker, I've known, you know, uh, of him for almost 20 years. I mean, he's got a good team behind him. So I give Tyron respect for going out and finding good people to put him in the best position to win this fight that he possibly can. He's got a very good team around. I mean, Pedro Diaz is a mastermind. He's really good. So it's going to be a, an exciting little duel between us on, on Sunday. BJ, how did you go from sparring to then training Jake? How, how did that transition? It's a good question. <laughs> um, I just, uh, I guess it kind of worked out where um, I went to Big Bear and Shane Mosley was the head trainer and he got a family, he had a family vacation planned for about, I think six months that his wife had set up for him. And uh, I, w I was there, you know, sparring with Jake. And when I was sparring with him and I was looking back on the films of us sparring, I was showing Jake little things, you know, things that he was, he was, he was, he was making errors on that, that could um, improve his efficiency, that can improve his his, his punch speed from A to B instead of going here or a hitch or bringing it back or, or, or doing little things that he just didn't even realize he was doing. So we broke down the film and we looked at it and I was showing him different things. And he was like, hey, can we work on that on the mitts? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So we worked the mitts. And the first time we worked the mitts, he was like, man, that, 
I've never worked the mitts like that. You know, that's that's something that, man, I, I don't know what you're doing on the mitts, but and that's how, you know, my father, Kenny Adams, they had always worked the mitts with me. So to me, it was like nothing. And Jacob had always worked the mitts with me like that. So I, I kind of that's that's how I'd worked the mitts my entire career. So after we worked the mitts a couple times, Jake told me and we were looking at film. Shane was actually gone on the family vacation for like eight or nine days. And this was six weeks before the fight. So you can't miss, you know, a week before, um, you know, um, you can't miss a week, six weeks before a fight. You can't miss a day. You can't miss a session. You got to be locked in, um, head down, focused every single session. So I kind of like got in, I helped a little bit. And then when Shane came back, um, Jake told uh, Shane, like I talked to Shane a little bit and they kept me around as an assistant um, to do the, do the mitt work, help break down film with Shane. And me and Shane kind of came up with a game plan with Gibb and we worked together and it was just a, a massive honor to work with, you know, a Hall of Fame fighter and a great fighter like Shane Mosley, who who really went out of his way to make Jake, uh, you know, um, make him feel comfortable and give him credibility because Shane's, you know, one of the biggest names in boxing. And when he brought Jake up to Big Bear and was, uh, you know, helping him get ready for the fight and working with him, it gave Jake a lot of credibility. And I just kind of like fit in wherever I fit in. And I, I really thought that would be the only fight I'd work with Jake. After we knocked out Gibb, I went home, went back to Arizona, was hanging out, partying, getting back to work, doing real estate stuff, getting in on the stock market again and trying to find out if I was going to buy crypto or Doge or what I was going to do. And then I got a call from Jake to, you know, move out to California a couple weeks later. So that's kind of how it, how it started. Yeah. Watching tape, what do you make of Tyron Woodley's last four fights? Fighting top, top, top level opposition. So everyone's like, oh, he's got four losses. Like, he's fighting the very best, best guys. I mean, let's let's keep it in perspective. You know, it's not like he's getting, um, you know, losing against bombs. He's fighting very, very good guys. So that's what I take out of it. I, look, I'm I'm not going to get on the the hype train with everybody else saying, oh, he's lost four in a row. He's, that's not what I see. I see a very tough, explosive, hard-punching fighter who's very determined. He's got a big chip on his shoulder, and he wants to come out and take Jake, Jake's head off. And that's all I see. I don't see any the faults you guys see. Like, I, I don't see that. I'm, take, I'm only looking at his strengths and what we got to do to negate those strengths. How does the uh, confidence or, and or anxiety this fight week compare to the Aspen fight week? It's fun. Is it the same or is it? Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, I don't really feel any different, honestly. Um, <clears throat> we're ready for Sunday. We're ready for the bell to ring. And it's just, like I said, it's just, you know, being a fighter, It's and, and this is something that people don't understand about being a fighter and being a, a trainer is it's a lot of waiting. You really have to wait. You really got to pull it back a lot of times. You just got to learn how to stay calm and live within your nerves and just be relaxed and not think about it and just have confidence that when the moment comes and the bell rings, you're going to go out there and perform because you've done every single thing leading up every single day to make sure you're prepared. And I know that without a shadow of doubt. If I could change one single thing in this camp over the last 100 days, every single day, two to three sessions a day, what would I change? Nothing. And that's why I feel very confident about uh, Sunday. Please decide if Jake gets past Tyron on Sunday. Has there been any talk about what's next? I'm not going to talk about that. Yeah, I don't care. Again, um, Sunday night we can have that conversation. Monday morning, any time after the fight, we can talk about that because yeah, <laughs> we can have an interview again after the fight. We, I mean, I've, I've heard like rumblings and different things like that, but I don't even pay attention to it. The thing about it is guys, you, you can't, you know, jump over a dollar for a nickel. You can't, you got to focus on what's right in front of you. And that's part of being a professional. Um, you, you can't get ahead of yourself. Jake doesn't have 10 years, 15 years of experience. To, to be in the situation to say, oh, we're for sure going to do this and do that. No, we got to we got to go out there and fight. I'm only worried about round one. That's it. I'm not even worried about round two. I'm only worried about round one, what we do in round one. Then I'm going to worry about round two, and, and we're going to come up with a game plan for that. So to answer your question, I have no idea. BT, does it kind of help that Jake has been knocking these guys out? Because what you said was nobody knows what he has to offer. And the more the mystique that surrounds him, the more guys are going to come out and say, I want to fight him. So it's ultimately kind of the game plan to get Tyron out of there early so another guy can step up and say, oh, you know, you fought an MMA fighter. I don't know what he's got. Uh, that's a strong possibility. Um, Tyron is not going to be ready for what comes at him in round one. I promise you he won't. Um, with all due respect to Tyron, like I said, he's a, he's, a, he's a very good combat fighter. He's a very good striker. But for, for whatever weird reason, <clears throat> he has not been educated on what's on Jake's team. He doesn't understand. I don't, I don't know how, but he just doesn't get it. He's like, oh, your team is weak and your team is this. And so, you know, if he thinks that, fine. You know, it's just uh, for, for whatever reason, he's not he hasn't like come to speed with what's going on on our side of the ball, which is fine. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, this fight could go one round. It could go three or four. rounds. I hope it goes three or four. I don't think it will. If it does. Great. Jake needs the rounds. Do you 
you think discrediting your team is just kind of a mental thing with Tyron? Do you think there's he is he does respect it, but it's part of the trash talk at the end of the day? Who really believes it? I don't care at all. It doesn't matter. Like the proofs in the pudding. Like honestly, like he'll, <laughs> we can have like we can have this conversation again Sunday, and then we can see what he says about it, about it after that. And again, like. We're we're in the back. We're the OGs. We don't we don't care. Like we just you know it's all about Jake and it's all about the team. We we're, me and Jacob we're we're in different phases of our lives now. We're we just we, we, we want to create and build. We want to make people better around us. We want to um, we want to make Jake as great as he possibly can be. We don't need the credit. It doesn't, I don't need, it doesn't need to be like that at all. We don't care at all. So it's uh it's all good. Yep. What do you make of Floyd Mayweather giving Tyrone advice? <laughs> it's good. I love it. I wish Floyd would show up and be in the corner with Tyrone. You know I right. wish he would. Uh, just because you know it, it, it makes more hype. Any 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 time Floyd Mayweather's involved in any type of event, it just creates more drama. And he's you know he's just the master uh, of of devising a game plan. He's the master of pay per views. So it'd be great. You know I I would love that. And I just love that you know Floyd went out of his way to to try to work with Tyron and help him to beat Jake. And obviously the whole Jake taking his hat and everything got under Floyd's skin. And Floyd's going out of his way. And you know I wish I wish Floyd had showed up to the fight, but I don't think he will. But I wish he would. Um, it'd make for a for a bigger event. Yeah. Final predictions? No. <laughs> I don't think I don't think it's gonna go too long, guys. I'd be surprised if it gets in the fourth or fifth round. My final prediction is Jake Paul will win. Um, I don't know which round, but he'll win for sure. Uh, you know, anything can happen. It's a it's a fight. Remember that Tyron's a champion. But all I got to say is, with all of the naysayers and all the people saying it's too much for Jake to handle, and he's not ready, and he's going to get knocked out, and Woodley's going to chin him, and he can't punch, and he's a Disney character, and blah blah blah, got third place in the Challenger Games, or whatever else they say mm -hmm. about him, just give him his credit after this fight. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thank cool. you guys so much. Appreciate it.